this is a very interesting man. Um, I'm sure pretty much everyone in the world has heard of Niagara bottled water and um, rightfully so. It is a massive company and this man built it bootstrapped from the ground up. So I also feel a little bit of a connection because we both came from Buffalo, New York originally. So a little bit of an extra tie in there. Um, so with Andy Paykoff Sr., the roots of Niagara bottled water began in Irvine, California in 1963, where Mr. Bakoff bootstrapped his business bottling high quality, low cost drinking water in five gallon glass containers. As the reputation of Niagara steadily grew, so did the business, eventually moving into the single serve private labeled bottling market. Today, Niagara is one of the largest private label bottlers in the United States, producing waters for companies such as Costco, Safeway Inc., and Walmart. Despite its industry-leading position, Niagara has remained a family-owned business oper and operated company, and in 2002, Mr. Paykoff Sr. appointed his son, Andy Paykoff Jr., as CEO. This company has continued to experience massive growth and is currently the largest privately-owned label, labeled bottler in the Western Hemisphere. Andy, I would love to hear your thoughts. Please take it away. Hi. Thanks for that uh... Pretty impressive uh, introduction. I don't know if all that's uh, justified, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is just uh, say a little bit about the way my life unfolded, and uh, then maybe we can do a question and answer, because it wasn't rocket science. It was just uh, kind of step by step. So I was born in Buffalo, New York. My parents are immigrants. Uh, I was born and raised in an upstairs flat. And for hey Andy, if, if you wouldn't mind, just so we can see you, you're a little bit out of frame. Could you move the camera down or sit back a little bit? I just want to, you're, yeah, perfect. Great. want to make sure everyone's able to see you. That'll okay. do. All righty. So um, basically we grew up in the ghetto and uh, my parents are immigrants, they're hardworking, we were poor. Uh, we didn't eat American food, but we had plenty of food to eat and it was tasty but it wasn't typical American stuff. I always did well in school. And I uh, did one year at the University of Buffalo and finished that and I was still only 16 years old, but I didn't continue because I could no longer afford the tuition. I ran out of money, so I went to work. I went to work and I always say, my dad said, any fool can make money, but it takes a smart man to save it. He also said, you got to work. And I remember those two things. I guess he had the old country way of teaching you and he kept on saying it until you got sick of hearing it, but it did stick with you. So when I was 18, I started tending bar in my dad's bar and continued in that line of work for almost five years. In the middle of that time, when I was 21, I went into a bar business with my big brother and we learned that we could only make $80 a week. And that was all there was. We couldn't make any more. And we worked 70 hours a week behind the bar. And it was 80 bucks a week. So we looked for opportunities elsewhere. Now that took me to California. I moved to California when I was not quite 23 years old. I was still 22. And I got a job as a milkman delivering milk to stores. And I was surprised at how much money people made. It was $129.50 a week for only 40 hours of work. And of course, you got overtime on top of that. Because I was not a graduate, I had no chance for advancement. I had a lot of free time and I was restless. So I had an opportunity when I was almost 24 years old to get a job as a store-to-store -store waterman that made more money. And I took it, I bought a used truck and fixed it. And that's what I did. And I did that for maybe six months, nine months. And then I got into a problem. The supervisor and the owner called me into the office one day and wanted to know why I was delivering so much water. And they were afraid that that was gonna create them problems with their customers. So they restricted me to four truckloads a week. I was selling a truckload a day. So there goes my future with that company. So I found a part-time job on Fridays. And then I also found 
eventually another water company to go to work for. So I took that other job and I failed. Then I tried to get home accounts. And that's how I started my own water business. I had very little money, no sales experience, no business building knowledge, no help. Had to work through tons of mistakes, most of which I caused. My goal was to end each day with at least one more customer than what I started with. I worked hard enough every day to grow a little bit every day. I didn't count the hours, I didn't count how many days a week I worked. My objectives were simple, to improve measurably every single day. I paid myself $95 a week for the first six years, and that's raising a family. When I was 30 years old, things started getting better because we've been doing it now for about six years and baby step by baby step every day, including up to today, it's still baby steps and you try to do them in the right direction. I made too many mistakes and worked my way through each one of them. Examples, truck problems, learn to be a mechanic. I had faulty plastic oils. That's a reservoir for a five gallon cooler. I had rusting coolers. I learned to sand and paint coolers and trucks. We had an issue with the name Niagara with the government. We had competition issues. One competitor used discount coupons against us to try to knock us off. Another one slandered us and tainted our water. Then I had an issue with the power company. They wanted us to move our building because they had a right of way. Nonsensible, but those are the type of problems. We had a lot of work ethic. One example of work ethic, we bought a US surplus trailer mounted water purification system located in San Antonio, Texas. I had a pindle hook hitch put on my car and after completing Friday deliveries to my customers, drove 2,800 miles round trip with my brother and seven year old son and returned in time to service my customers Monday morning. We were always growing into unknown issues, always making progress, encountering new problems and finding solutions. I had a very bad experience in 1978 with my first and last bank loan, which was to finance real estate for a bottling plant. The all-consuming stress of making the high interest payments took all my waking thoughts and was not worth it. I promised myself to never have debt. If we couldn't afford it, we didn't need it. When you're the little guy, you're easily victimized. When you're big, the game changes. Fast forward, now I'm almost 60 years old. We're growing fast. We're up to 40% growth rate for compounded for several years. Hired my 22 year old son, Andy, when he graduated from SNU. We needed bright young lions, I call them, to take Niagara forward, baby step by baby step. We recruited bright, eager, motivated, driven, hardworking young people. Almost all are still with us and are having wonderful careers. Fast forward another five years, the company's at 30 million revenue. I had a TIA, that's a transient ischemic accident. In English, that's a stroke that you get over. I had that in a high pressure vendor meeting. My son Andy fired me and promoted me to chairman and took over. He fired me out of love, of course. Since then, the many experiences and things I've learned over the years allow me to continue and to contribute to our growth, efficiencies, and innovations. Now I'm 81 years old. Niagara is the Western Hemisphere's largest volume bottled water company, the most technically advanced, the most eco-friendly, the most automated, the fastest, most energy efficient bottling lines in the world and has created thousands of good paying jobs for Americans and is 100% owned by my son, Andy. 
Um, that's about it as far as a general thing. And uh, I, maybe someone would like to ask me some questions. And I, hopefully I can answer in a useful Yeah, Sandy, thank you so much. We definitely, we definitely do. First of all, would you, could you tilt your computer down a little bit for me so we can get more of your head? Or we're, you're very much at the bottom of your screen right now. Yeah. Is that better? Do, do that same thing one more time and, and I think we're, we're gonna be golden. Perfect, okay, great, that is outstanding. Okay, um, yes. So the first question came from an anonymous. Would you advise most students to start a business? Why or why not? Well, that's a great question. And that's not a yes or no answer. That's up to, the, that's up to that person. You have to have the entrepreneurial spirit. You have to be willing to do whatever's necessary and not give up because it's not going to be easy. If you want easy, get a job someplace. Okay. But if you're an entrepreneur, sometimes that doesn't work for you. Uh, you've got this fire inside of you that you want to do your own thing and you want to make something out of yourself. So it goes back to that individual is where they're coming from. What, what are some more of those, uh, entrepreneurial assets that you think should be fostered to create a successful entrepreneur who would be starting a business? I think it's pretty basic. I think you have to have strong work ethic. You have to have strong savings ethic. I think those are the two biggest things. And to describe that a little bit, work ethic means you're not talking 40 hours a week. You're talking 80, 100 hours a week, whatever it takes. And you're not gonna wake up one day and be rich. That doesn't happen that way. You're going to succeed first while you're struggling, okay? First you succeed, then you make money. But it takes you a long time to learn to succeed. So you've gotta have that stick to activity. You've gotta really have strong work ethic. You can't quit. You can't give up. You're gonna have friends doing a lot better than you are because they've got good paying jobs, but you're taking steps in the right direction. Okay. This comes from Melina. She says, hi, Mr. P. What advice would you give to a current team member at Niagara on navigating a fast paced environment? Niagara does have a fast paced environment and it's the same advice. Just do the best you possibly can do. And that's one of the things that a lot of Niagara team members have in common. They're really motivated and hardworking people. And uh, they want to make something out of their life. They want to have a career. They want to do something and they're willing to work hard enough to make it happen. So the best advice is Give it your best shot. Give it all you got. And when you do, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? The results will take care of themselves. Thank you. Um, what in a saturated market, bottled water, obviously, there's lots of people doing bottled water. What makes from the start, what made you stand out? What really helped you grow? You did speak to that a little bit, but I mean, from then till now, in a, in a saturated market, what really helped you to keep a leg up and, ha and have a growing productive business? Well, the word saturated market is kind of an interesting uh, word. I suppose all markets are saturated on any given day or else they would be a different size. And then if they were a different size, they'd still be saturated. What separates you is your ability to change the market, to cause that market to grow, to figure out a way to grow the market. Okay, so that doesn't happen in uh, 10 seconds of thinking about it. It happens over years of working your best, thinking of how to improve things, thinking how to reduce costs, not just thinking about it, but actually 
getting the job done, reducing costs, creating value, uh, giving people more reasons to buy your product. In our case, it was bottled water, but whatever the product, you've got to create value. And you got to have a way to separate yourself from the other guys with value and with quality, with service, all the things that people are interested in. And what makes the market grow is when all those things align. When you have affordability with quality, people are going to buy it, whatever it is. I hope that is. Um, did the business change the way you thought it would over time, or did you look back and see a totally different experience than you were anticipating? Well, the business has been constantly evolving. When I started, uh, the first thing I did was deliver water to stores in gallon bottles. And then the second thing I did was deliver half gallon bottles to stores. Then the third thing was five gallon to home, and all of these were glass bottles. And then that evolved into plastic bottles. And that ended up evolving into the, what we call the grocery package, basically the half liter bottles. And that evolved from higher prices to continually lowering prices to where it got to be very affordable and encourage people to buy it. To where now it's the lowest cost way to get water is well, you, like they mentioned Costco and Walmart, you can buy our products there under their names for way less than 10 cents a bottle. You know, we're talking like seven, eight cents a bottle you can buy water for. And that's so ridiculously low priced. Of course, people are going to buy it. It's handy. It's a good product. It's better than any other beverage to drink and it costs less. It's the best beverage at the lowest price when you talk about what's good for your body. What do you, in that mindset, what do you think differentiates water companies? Um, uh, you've spoken to some things like obviously sustainability and those aspects, but from a, from a product point, what, what is kind of your, your thought on what really differentiates? Well, you can break the product into two different things, the actual liquid in the bottle, okay? And then you can look at everything else around it, the bottle, the cap, the package, the, uh, the service, the freight, the value proposition, the uh, overall quality, ease of use for the customer. And uh, we've kind of blazed the trail in all those areas. Uh, we're the ones that invented the lightweight bottle. We invented the lightweight cap. Uh, we're the ones that took corrugated out of uh, the packaging. Water used to come in cardboard boxes. Now there's no box. It went from a cardboard box to a tray to a pad to just the film only. And that keeps on reducing the cost and keeps on improving the eco-friendliness. And then we went from a cap that took three or four turns to open the bottle to a cap that opens like this, just like that, and it's open. And uh, 100 and 20 degrees, it's open. And those are all our inventions. And that just makes it easier for the customers to use it and keeps on reducing the cost. So it's affordability, convenience, quality, eco-friendliness. Keep on pushing the bars in all those areas. Uh, so new questions here. We have one. What was a memorable failure and what was the lesson you learned from it? Oh, boy. <laughs> <clears throat> I had many memorable failures. I, I, I say it this way. I wasn't smart enough to give up. Uh, almost all businesses fail. And they don't fail because the business concept's bad. They fail because they're not willing to work enough to make it succeed because it's a huge amount of work. Well, one example, when we were the very first day that I had a truck, that was my truck. I, I bought a truck, like the first water company I went with, they had a, a deal. You could have either used their truck and earned 20% commission on the sales 
or you could have bought your own truck and earned 30 percent well that was 50 percent more so it made sense to buy your own truck so i did so i bought a used truck well when i got to my first customer the transmission wouldn't shift that's a pretty good failure i couldn't get to the first customer so i burned up the transmission because i didn't know that you had to check to see that there was oil inside of the transmission. So I melted the gears together. So it cost me half the price of the truck to fix that. And here I'm not making any money yet. It's just spending. And then a couple of days later, while I was delivering water after it was all fixed, a uh, guy comes beeping the horn and says, hey, your wheel's falling off your truck. And it was. And I didn't know about that type of stuff, the things you were supposed to make sure your lug nuts were tight. I didn't know. But the lug nuts are the nuts that hold the wheels on. And there were six of them on my left rear wheel and five of them had snapped off. Nobody got hurt. But uh, those type of things would make it easier for you to say, I don't think this is for me. Then a short time after, I bought 800 of these plastic reservoirs. They call them Oyas for uh, where you dump the bottle of water into them and it holds the water you know, with a faucet on it. And they were all faulty. And I, they had a plastic smell, a terrible plastic smell. And I paid a dollar and a half for them. That means $1,200. I have to back up and say, I started my business with $6,000. Okay, 1,200 of it went for those plastic oils. So I set up a brand new customer. And she called me up before I even got home at the end of the day and said that she wanted to cancel the service because she didn't like the way it tasted. I went right back out to her home and asked her for a glass and tasted it. And I spit it out. It was terrible. And it was the, the oil it was just made the water taste horrible. Okay. Well, you can't keep customers if your water's terrible. I took those Oyas back to the manufacturer and I said, smell that. And he took the, the Oya and went, smells fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they gave me 25 cents back for each one of them. So <laughs> I gave him a uh, dollar and a half. He gave me back 25 cents times 800. That was about 25% or 20% of my total assets at that time because I trusted him. And you got to know who you're going to trust. You can't not trust everybody. Some people are trustworthy, some are not. Expound on that. Tell me a little bit about that. How, how as, as people starting out or just growing their businesses, how, how do you, what do you use as a marker for how to gauge good people and good relationships? Well, most people are good people. Okay. Um, what, 90%, 95%, 98% of the people that you're ever going to meet, they're really good people. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to make a profit just because you're working with good people. You still have to offer a value. You have to give people something they they want you got to satisfy their need. And in our case, everybody drinks water. Well, God made us to drink water. So that's a, that part's a no brainer. But then the challenge was, how do you make it affordable? How do you make it taste good? How do you give good service? How do you have a package that the people will want to buy again and again? Okay. So it's, uh, Yes, you're going to be dealing with good people, but don't take your eye off what's really uh, the method to success. And that is giving to people what they want. I hope that answered that. It does. Um, well, tell me a little bit more about, obviously, you guys have a super forward thinking uh, bottle and production facility. And so being forward thinking is obviously very important to you and your business. How, how did you decide on what resources to allocate and, and really how much emphasis to give to that what's next? 
That's a great question. And you know what? It's been baby steps all along. And it's not like you have this uh, great big vision one day and you say, hey, I've just invented sliced bread. It's not like that. It's uh, like, for example, there were certain key points in the business. Like when we started selling water to stores that when we were in our own business, we were selling gallon bottles. There were these gallon milk bottles, you know, the plastic, the, the cloudy milk bottles. You know what I'm yeah, talking about? I do. Yeah, well, we were buying those from the uh, manufacturers that were selling bottles and we were filling them and, and we were doing fine. Okay, but every time there was like uh, an earthquake or a flood, you know, a big rainstorm or a war scare or something, the vendors could never supply us bottles. They always made the same excuse that their machine broke. Well, what that really meant was we were the small player and they were taking care of their big customers because there was a demand for bottles. Okay, so we made the decision that the next time after that happened a few times, that the next time they did that, we were going to go buy a blow motor and make our own bottles. Well, we didn't know a thing about that. And that's a completely different business, right? Making bottles. But we figured if we were going to grow, we didn't have a choice. So it happened again with, uh, I remember the exact date, it was January 17th, in 1994, there was this big earthquake right, in the California and they stopped giving us bottles again. And the 18th, I signed a deal with the uh, blow mold manufacturer to sell us a gallon blow molder. Then we, so we, that was necessity was the mother of invention there, right? We didn't have this great big uh, epiphany as, oh boy, we just invented sliced bread. We had to do something if we wanted to keep on growing. So what we learned was that we could make a bottle for about half the price of what we were buying them for. So that made us even more competitive. We were able to reduce our cost to our customers even more, which increased our volume even more. And then we ended up buying more blow molders. The next year we bought another one and the following year we bought another one. And as the business kept growing. So we also found out, it's all, again now, the little baby, that was a big step, but then there were baby steps that happened off of that. Like now you're making your own bottles. Now you got to make a decision as to how much gram weight do you want that bottle to weigh? So you think about that quality and you say, well, the guys that we were buying bottles from had to make a bottle strong enough to transport it to us empty without getting all dented up. So if we're gonna make the bottle and we're gonna fill it right away, we don't have those transportation issues. So we could take a little bit of weight off of that bottle and we can save it even a little bit more money. So you see how that's a little baby step that follows. And those type of baby steps are what over the years there's so many of them that happen that help separate you from your competitors in a positive way. Uh, there's so many more questions I wanna ask. I thought that was super insightful. I wish we had the time. Um, sadly, I'm gonna close with this question. I don't even get to ask several that are on here. Um, but looking back, would you do it again? Or would you have taken that job you referenced? Well, I'm an entrepreneur by heart. I, always wanted to work for myself okay i had no clue that the company was going to get so huge i mean it's the largest company in the western hemisphere but maybe in the world we don't know but uh, uh it's just what happens when you keep on plugging away okay andy thank you for your authenticity thank you for your knowledge i appreciate you very much thank you for taking the time with us you're welcome glad to have helped Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's it. That's, that's our show. That's what we're doing right now.